Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Right, well, I think we've had um, you know, three very interesting um, addresses by the, the, the speakers. Um, I'd now like to invite um, really any questions or comments, observations um, from the floor. I'm sure you're all bursting at the seams with uh, uh, questions that you want to ask. Don. One for Ian. Any collaborative Just that? Yes, that's it. Um, do you recommend any collaborative working environments for uh, organizations today? Uh, absolutely. There's, there's a great organization that provides a service called Huddle, huddle.net. And, and I, I came across that about four or five years ago. Um, and it's effectively a, a, a pop-up shop sort of extra environment. You know, you, it was used by uh, UEFA in planning sort of UEFA championships they involved. Uh, emergency services, they involved advertisers, marketers, and the Football Association. Um, and I think, you know, SharePoint, uh, you know, Office 365, which is available sort of as a pay-as-you-go sort of basis now, really provides really slick, you know, high capability, high capacity, you know, collaborative environments uh, without having to go through the pain of working with a corporate IT department. But I think, I th I think the growth in sort of social online collaborative spaces uh, is going to give rise to a very mobile workforce. And again, my point about being able to inherit your sort of information profile from one organization to the next, these collaborative spaces are going to enable you to do that. Okay. Uh, Darren. Uh, in looking at the future, do you think there are enough uh, smart people to uh, <laughs> deliver these wonderful visions? Yeah. I, I, it's interesting because about, I think it was about 10 years ago, I was at a round table lunch with um, Nigel, Nigel Oxborough, who sort of founded uh, TFBL. And I said, you know, I increasingly, you know, uh, don't need more smart technology, I need smarter people. I think we've reached a, a tipping point in the capacity for human beings to be able to manipulate and navigate the information space that we have is, is, is beyond the pale. I think visualizing data sets is going to be a real key enabler for individuals to be able to make sense of the information that we've got. Um, I think the level of IT literacy in organizations is woeful. You know, I've worked at some amazing professional service organizations with you know, great lawyers, great accountants, great tax professionals, but their ability to use a computer uh, is sadly lacking. Their ability to use smart devices is sadly lacking and therefore their ability to sort of navigate these vast information spaces is almost you know, non-existent. So I, th so I think there's a real need to go back to basics and help people to navigate. I think training is one of the first things that gets cut, cut in an organization at the time of a recession. Um, but I think we need to invest more in training to equip you know, the existing workforce with the skills that the millennials are going to follow up the rear with. Okay. Got another one. <laughs> Has anyone on the panel heard about we're now in the human age rather than technology age? It's a report by Manpal. Just interested. In I've, I've, not, I've not heard of it, but I, I'm certainly a big advocate of us being human beings and not human doings. I, I think it's bizarre that uh, we, we go through the, the revolving doors of our organizations and hang our humanity on the, on the doorstep and um, just sit in front of a computer, you know, chained. You've seen that the, the evolution of man sort of illustration where, you know, apes progress to being hunched over laptops in the 21st century. I think we need to get back to having conversations. We need to get back to having um, you know, provocative debate uh, rather than being isolated in front of computers. So I think you're absolutely right. Okay, question back uh, from Catherine, I think. Um, but isn't part of the point that that's what organisations are like, and there are very few organisations, especially older organisations, that are capable of starting with a brand new culture? And um, I mean, I, I work with some millennials, and I'm sure they behave completely differently when they're with their friend in a much more social and collaborative way. But when they're in the office, they take on the culture of the organisation and they send emails all the time. If, if, I, th if I think back to when I worked for Shell back in the 1990s, uh, and Shell established uh, online you know, discussion forums, and they established something called the Virtual Chief Scientist. And so you know, big organizations, big unwieldy corporates like Shell and BP, uh, and particularly those in the engineering space, have been providing 
great working environments to enable people to collaborate and to be human for such a long time. I think, it's, I think I've noticed in the city you know, over the last 15 years this propensity for people to be siloed, to be information workers as opposed to human beings. And so, so I think it's still, a lot, it's still a long way to go for organisations to provide environments where humans can actually be humans. Any questions? Oh. Thanks. Um, obviously, this was supposed to be about what's happening in 2013. Do you actually think any of that is likely to happen in 12 months? Absolutely. A absolutely. If I, if I, if I look at, uh, take SharePoint, you know, many organisations around here will be using SharePoint, and we've struggled with SharePoint 2003, 2007, 2010. SharePoint 2013 is a completely social uh, you know, information, collaboration, working environment, which is going to free people up from the very linear sort of uh, shackles of email and put them back into the sort of social space, which we see happening, you know, in, in the reality in the sort of the B2C, the sort of the consumer environment. Look at the sort of the bring your own device culture, which organisations like PwC have now uh, introduced a bring your own device uh, sort of strategy where individuals will bring their iPads and their, and their iPhones and their Android devices to be supported. And I think the more than we can support individuals to do the things that they do when they're not spending those you know, 8 to 12 hours in the office, I think it's going to have a massive effect. And I think we're seeing it already take place you know, in, in big organisations. Okay. Don? Change the subject a little bit. Uh, thank you for your considered overviews on 2013, Francesco and Robin. Um, you gave us a great global picture, but I was wondering uh, if we could bring it closer to home as to what your views are for the city in 2013. Um, I've read a couple of interesting things lately. One was that the number of people in banking in the city is now down, I think, 30% from the peak, um, down to, I think it's 1996 levels. But yesterday in the Financial Times, there was an article about financial services employment, which is basically flat over the last four years, um, where the growth, I believe, is in uh, where, the, where the accountants and lawyers. I was trying to figure out who's going to fill all these uh, high rises that are going up. I assume it's going to be all bankers and, uh, excuse me, all lawyers and accountants. Um, so what are your uh, collective views on 2013 in the city? You start, Gun. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you've read all of these articles. Make sure it's prep for this one. I think, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very important question, I think, because uh, we're starting to see the effects of deleveraging, really, and the effects to some, I mean, also of the regulations which are being uh, rightly, in our view, um, passed on, uh, on, 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 on the way the banks work and, and what they can and can't do. And I think. I mean, there was there was news um, a month or two ago about UBS uh, cutting over, I think, 10,000 jobs. Uh, there was more in Citigroup. This wasn't this wasn't about the city. It was about their global operations. Um, but I think next year uh, there will be uh, probably more of that. Uh, now, is that a bad thing? Well, I, th I think I think we should. I mean, if if the objective of this economy, as the government has said uh, time and again, is to rebalance from a, an economy which is only providing, or not only, but mainly providing services, and, and in particular banking services, to something which is, um, which is diversifying into, you know, maybe going back to manufacturing uh, at the high end in particular, then maybe this is something which, which over the long run, uh, we shouldn't worry about and maybe a good thing that a few more uh, engineering graduates go back and, and practice, you know, and be engineers rather than join an investment bank may actually be a good thing. But that's in the long run. Now, over the short run, I think that there, I mean, there is a case for uh, being slightly worried about the transition. And I find at times, I think this is a more general point, um, there is an excessive optim, I mean, if you, if you buy a slightly more optimistic view about what's, what's happening in the Eurozone, then I think you should not be so worried about the future of this country as a whole. But what I find perplexing, and I had, I had, a, had a chat with some economists at, um, for, who work for a large bank, who had a very, um, had a forecast of minus 0.7% uh, 
of GDP for, for next year for the Eurozone and plus 0.8% for, for Britain. Now, I find that very perplexing. Uh, I think the future of this country is tied to the Eurozone much more than uh, people are often willing to recognize and acknowledge. Um, just on the, on the city specifically, because um, I think it's useful to have a framework for thinking about this, and, and the city is largely around financial services. So firstly, what's going to happen to financial services as an industry <coughs> worldwide? And then where does London specifically sit within that? And I think if you think about it in those terms, there are quite a lot of risks. So in the financial services industry, in aggregate, is shrinking. And you, you mentioned some numbers around employment here in London, but obviously this is a trend that we see happening all around the world. And, and that's exactly what you would have expected, that the balance sheets are being shrunk because a lot of credit was extended that is now perceived to have been far too risky and, and, and in many instances not actually likely to be repaid. So the financial industry, at least those bits of it that engage in those activities, is shrinking very quickly. And that we see happening everywhere. In London, we see it happening in New York, we see it happening in Frankfurt. So the industry is shrinking. So that's the first problem. The second problem is where does the city of London sit within the global competitive landscape for that industry? And I think that's quite interesting because at the moment, London has this tremendous advantage, and while we can argue about all the different things that might go to make that up, essentially I would say the biggest advantage we have is the fact that we have attracted all these people and these ancillary services here. There's what we call a cluster or a kind of network effect that all the top accountants are here, the top legal firms, all the top investment bankers are all here, and that makes London a peculiarly attractive place to run a financial services operation. But of course, that's not static. Um, and we constantly worry about competition for London in some sectors of financial services back to New York. And I think perhaps the big challenge now is the danger, the changing nature of the UK's relationship with the European Union, meaning that actually the, the position of the City of London in global finance may come under threat because of actions that we see being taken on the continent. And this idea that as Britain gradually slides into a perhaps a, a less, a less comfortable relationship with the European Union. Um, we certainly don't expect to see Britain exit the EU, but it's pretty clear that Britain is becoming sort of semi-detached from political thinking in Europe. Um, those things over time could drive a difference in, the, in where you would optimise, you would optimally place financial services industry, which is trading within the Eurozone, a Euro denominated, um, trading in Euro denominated instruments. So I think that when you think about the City of London, we have to recognise the global trend is for a smaller financial services industry. We've suffered from that. And then there are specific threats to the UK's own position, which could be mitigated. Um, but at the moment, I would say that all the political signs are there are substantial risks there, because Britain's political engagement with Europe is actually rather negative. And over time, not in 2013, for the person who was asking what we thought was going to happen next year, but over a 10-year horizon, I think it's not difficult to imagine that Britain could engineer a situation where its distance from Europe meant that the financial services industry started to migrate somewhere else. I think that's not hard to imagine. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we've probably got time for one more question if anybody uh, wants to ask one last question. Geraldine at the back. I'm going to try to ask one that will link two aspects that uh, speakers have discussed about. Millennium uh, all the millenniums or whatever you call them that are coming through uh, in organisation and what the impact might be on the economy and the way organisations are run or even how crowdsourcing can start having an impact. I'm um, thinking of Starbucks where they've made a gesture you can look at it in whichever way you want. What do you think the, the, the new approach to the work environment that new generations are coming through and using technology is likely to have an impact on the way the economy is run? Right. Robert, so, so yeah. I, was inter I nearly said something in the previous question about that, because I, I think there is a real danger that we can become too pessimistic about the capacity of companies to, to change the way they do business. Um, and that we, we see these new technologies and we think that firms are not adapting them quickly enough and we get very worried about that. And I guess a, a, a something that sits alongside that, you get this new generation who are behaving in one way out of the office environment, very connected, very tech savvy and in the office where we're requiring them to work in, in more mundane ways. Um, 
but of course I, I represent an organisation which has been around for a very long time. We've been around for 160 years and we're not bust yet, so I guess something's changed. Uh, we print in colour now. Um, that was a relatively recent um, um, advent, but nonetheless, you know, we, we now circulate globally. Um, so clearly some things have changed, but when I joined the organisation, which was back in 95, and this was the EIU, not the Economist, um, they'd only had desktop computers for two years. Um, they'd only rolled out an email system that year when I joined. Um, Blackberries, of course, did not exist. Now, I would argue that a 160-year-old organisation, we were pretty staid. You could say we were slow. I remember at the time, people, all young people joining the organisation grumbled that, that the company was behind, the tech department was rubbish. I mean, all, all organisations are like that. But the reality is, um, we've moved on. You know, we, Everyone in the organisation is using a desktop or a laptop. Everyone has got a Blackberry. We all have mobile phones. Um, email is, is absolutely front and centre of what we do, but we do use other forums as well, instant messaging and stuff. We use video conferencing. Now, we're not using the latest cutting edge technology to run our business. Um, and it may well be the case that in 10 years' time we will, but I think a very important thing to keep in mind is that organisations do not exist to exploit the latest technological innovation. They exist to do some business objective. For us, it's to produce these economic and political forecasts, um, and the FT is to produce a daily newspaper. Um, and you deploy the technologies that are available out there, which enable you to do that most efficiency, efficiently, given the skill sets of the people you have in-house and the cost benefit of actually implementing it. Um, and my organisation, I think, is a great case study in the way that even very long-lived companies do embrace new technology <coughs> when they recognise that that is a profitable, cost-effective thing for them to do to make them achieve their core objective better. I mean, you look at what we were publishing in EIU 10 years ago compared to today, there's no comparison. I mean, it's moved on light years and we've adopted all sorts of new technologies and systems to let us do that. I mean, the FT as well. I mean, we're now, you know, it's publishing pretty much real time on the website. They have edi different editions all around the world. It wasn't like that 10 years ago. So technology has been adopted. But I think it's wrong to approach this from the end of looking what's out there in the market, who's launching what new social networking forum, and saying, oh, we should be having that. And if we haven't, we're dropping behind. Actually, the key priority of organisations is to deliver on the core business objective, and that is not to use the latest technologies to get the paper out or whatever it is that we're doing. And then companies, I would say, do um, go out there and bring in the latest and best technology when it's most relevant. And the very fact that we still exist after 160 years, and the FT, I'm not sure how long the FT's been around, but quite a long time as well, is still... Longer than, I, longer than I've been around. Yeah, it's still doing well. <laughs> I think it's, it's suggestive um, that actually we shouldn't be too pessimistic um, about the ability of businesses to change. Um, and the ability of this young generation, which I get what you're asking about, to drive change within their organisations. Um, but we need to recognise that that change happens only when it's supportive of profitably fulfilling the corporate's core business objective, not because everyone thinks that Facebook's a good idea or whatever. So I think, I, I, I think don't be too pessimistic. I, th I think having, having worked most recently with with millennials in the in the law firm that I currently work with and having lunchtime conversations with millennials um, there is going to be a rude awakening for organizations because millennials aren't interested in the ideals of pale stale males running the FTSE 250 they're interested in um, having a life they're interested in having a work-life balance and they're interested in being able to exist and achieve what they're asked to do by their lords and masters in the most stress-free, hurdle-free way possible. And so whilst um, organisations, particularly you know, the media industry, have, have, have grasped sort of new technologies and adapted fairly quickly, there are many, many organisations in the world which are failing to move from the 1950s thinking of uh, operating and, and running their business and managing their people. So, so I think, you know, uh, there is, there's going to be a, a greater demand from millennials to actually you know, do the nine to five, to achieve what they want to achieve in that nine to five space. Um, whether it's profitable for the organization or not, they're not going to care because we see individuals now moving from job to job every year, every two years. Um, so I think there's a, there's, a, there's a big change in the way that millennials see the world of work and therefore technology must be provided to them to enable them to move from place to place because we know that collaborative working environments are all about bringing people together and sharing good ideas. We're going to have a very networked, mobile, nomadic workforce 
which is going to be for the better good of the economy and the better good for organisations. I would, I would just say though, just think it's important to recognise that ultimately millennials, if they're going to work, they have to work for companies that make money. Um, that it isn't any good. I mean, they may say they only want to do nine to five, and that's great. But if the company isn't profitable, it goes bust. So ultimately, I mean, creative destruction is really important here. That old companies like mine, we, we would have gone bust if we hadn't changed. But we did change, and, and we've employed lots of millennials. We employ lots of people from all generations. Um, but if you work for a company which is adopting all these new technologies, regardless of whether that actually improves or retards your ability to be profitable, you're not going to be working for very long. And I do think it's important to recognise that, that actually um, there is, it's a false choice to say that you can either work for somewhere which is adopting all the latest kit or you could work for somewhere that's stayed but profitable. Ultimately, we've all got to work for somewhere that's profitable, otherwise um, you're going to be unemployed. So I, I, I just think we need to be a little bit careful about um, positioning the, the tools in front of the overall business objective. <coughs> Ultimately, the business has got to be survivable, sustainable, survivable. Um, and if that requires it to adopt these new techniques, that's great. If it doesn't, that's great too. But if you adopt a load of new techniques that actually drive you into loss, you're not going to be working. Ferdinando, anything no. to add to that? No, you're good. OK. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's staying out of it. So. <laughs> OK, all right, look, um, I, you know, we're going to... Um, Call a close now. Um, it's around about five to ten, so we're a little out of time. Uh, we're going to let Ian and Robin have their their conversation offline <laughs> after this. So uh, uh, you go sort it out, guys. Um, from from my perspective, um, I, I would just like to say um, a, a number of thank yous. First and foremost, to Seven Side um, and the FT for sponsoring, and furthermore to the FT for actually hosting us here today. I think they've done a fantastic job. Um, looks like you pretty much demolished breakfast at the back of the room there, so that's a good sign. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for coming along today and uh, making this event. Uh, what it is and I uh, appreciate you uh, all dragging yourselves out of bed uh, early to get here uh, and then finally I'd, I'd really just like to thank our uh, three speakers who have given us I think a uh, you know, fascinating insight into their thoughts and uh, their organization's perspectives on uh, on the next year and uh, you know we'll, um, we'll look forward to kind of seeing whether any of these things come to pass so um, thank you very much indeed thank you um, one thing I forgot, and I knew I'd forget to do it, on, on leaving the building, um, just to note really, when you uh, jump in the lifts, you actually need to press the second floor um, to actually get out. That's the, 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 the floor on which the reception is that you came into. So um, if you're confused, please remember it's the second floor. Okay, thank you.